Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. I'm just going to we're just going to start there but we're going to be looking at verse 11. But this is what it says at the very end of the letter of Ephesians. There is a call to battle. There is a call to battle. And that's what we have here in Ephesians 6:10. Finally. And we looked at this last week. Finally means whatever is left and whatever is left in your life, whatever is left in my life, the Apostle Paul wants us to be strong and dunamo, be strong. That, that word means to be made strong. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength or the power of his might. It's, a, it's something that the Apostle Paul longs for his disciples to be. Be strong, be made strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. How utterly different are we than anybody else? We don't have any power. The church has no power of its own, but we have a power in him. And that's what we're going to be continuing to look at. There are 2.38 billion Christians on this planet. Oh, that those Christians would move in the power of God. Oh, that we would. This is the call of the hour. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Just turn to Luke chapter 10 just for a second. Luke chapter 10. When I was a little boy, I grew up when my granddad was alive and my, my granddad came from a farming background. So we were, we, we were a milk, my granddad was a milkman, my dad was a milkman and I was a milkman for a bit too. And we, we always had collie dogs. And I can remember as a boy, my granddad had two collie dogs. One was called Skippy, one was called Ricky. And they were, you know, those big, the really big bushy black and white collie dogs. They were beautiful dogs. And they were outside dogs. They never got to come in. And they'd always sit on the drive and they'd wait for granddad to come with his milk float. And, you know, as soon as they saw him, they'd, they'd get animated. And as a kid, I used to roll around with them. I'd ride them. You know, I'd, I'd play. I'd, you could do anything with them. They were lovely animals. Until one day... Um, when Skippy, I just saw Skippy, um, and he was, he'd gone at the back of these bushes. And so as a kid, obviously, I just wanted to play with Skippy as I normally did. So I went towards him, and I realized that, uh, uh, that, that half of his side was just all his skin and his hair was gone. And it, it was just red raw flesh, you know, and he was bleeding. He'd obviously been hit by a car. So as a kid... I'm going up to him thinking nothing's changed, you know, I'll put my arm around him and all that, and he bit me. He bit me. He completely changed. And we have been looking, and we are continuing to look without denominational bias. I care not about denominations. If denominations were the answer, we'd have found the answer by now, folks. They are not the answer. And nobody's got this perfectly right, nobody. But there are people that have been hit spiritually, if you like, by the misuse of the gifts of the Spirit. And they're carrying away. And at one time they were playful and they loved the Lord. And, but now you try and go near them, they'll take your hand off. And there are people like that. And that's just the, the sad reality of the day that we're in. But that doesn't change anything. Do you understand, church? Yeah. It doesn't change the fact that we need the Holy Spirit. No matter how many counterfeits there are out there of money, you don't stop using money. Yeah. Or if there's bad air, you don't say, well, from now on, I refuse to breathe. Or because you've had some bad food and it made you vomit one day, you don't go on a hunger strike for the rest of your life. And so here we, the call is to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And here Jesus sends them out. He sends out, this, he's, he's training them. 
And it says, And the seventy returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons were subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I was watching and I, uh, Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And behold, I have given you exousio. I've given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over the power of the enemy. And nothing will injure you. Now, friends, that does not mean that every time you go out there, you're always going to win. It doesn't mean that. That is not what this means. This is not a, a card which means no matter what you do, you're not going to get in trouble. It doesn't mean you're not going to get persecuted. But it does mean that you belong to him. And the church does have that authority. We do have that. At least the real church. Those that have oil in their lamps. And he says, nevertheless... Do not rejoice in this. Don't rejoice in the whole demon thing. If you've seen that, wonderful. Don't rejoice in it, that the spirits are subject to you. But rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Now, I mentioned this on Tuesday. There, there are people that have had, for whatever reason, a bad experience of the spiritual. There are people that before they were saved meddled in the Ouija board or meddled with the occult or meddled with fairies or I don't know what. And so they come into Christianity with this bias and they're very defensive. It's okay to look at the dark but don't ever dare look at the light. You know? It's okay to be fascinated by the occult but whatever you do, steer clear of the Holy Spirit. How can that be? How can that be, church? That can't be right. And I believe that what I'm giving you this morning is from heaven. I want to communicate this to you, that the Lord longs to give us the Holy Spirit. Amen. And how he does that is not down to me, and it's not down to you. But for the hour that we have, we have to match this hour with boldness. And I said on Tuesday, you know, on Wednesday, <laughs> when I used to go to the pubs, people were fascinated with fruit machines. And I'd watch them put all this money into fruit machines and they pull a lever and the, winds would, the wheels would start spinning and they go bing, 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 bing. Uh, and they either win or they lose. Most of the time they lose. But there's something about people's experience when it comes to the Holy Spirit. It's like pulling a wheel on a on a fruit machine and every wheel goes into flux when you mention the Holy Spirit you can see people getting defensive or trying to work out whether your Holy Spirit is their Holy Spirit and it's this mishmash this absolute confusion that we're in and imagine you've got four wheels the, four, the first one is subjective experience the second one is your doctrinal bias the third one is terminology because that gets in the way so much and the fourth is fear Fear and fear of being hurt. And every time you mention the Holy Spirit, you pull the lever. You can see people trying to work out and the wheels are in spin. And then all of a sudden they go, ding, ding, ding. This is what I am. This is what I believe. And you better believe what I believe. And so we have 40,000 denominations. The church is making no headway. Darkness is pervading into the West. We can't agree on anything anymore. And the enemy is moving in power. And we need the, the only one that can give us that power is the third part of the triunity. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. So it's time that we, 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 we have to be able to almost unlearn to a point what we've learned. To try our best to throw away our bias and say, Lord... You did wonders in my life in days past, but I want to be filled again. And I don't necessarily want what you had for me back then. What have you got for us today, Lord? How do you meet this hour that we're in today? Well, you've got our prime minister. One week he's saying one thing, the next week he's saying another thing. He seems to be trying to please all people from all persuasions. He's like a Neville Chamberlain. 
God raise up men and women that will stand. Stand. Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, verse 49. These are the words of Jesus. You ask a Christian, will, would you trust Jesus? Of course they would trust Jesus. They trust Jesus, but they're, but, but they're a bit suspicious about the Holy Spirit. What on earth is that? That's so bizarre. Listen very carefully. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. Who is sending this forth? Jesus you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That word clothed and duo is the same word that's used in Ephesians 6 for put on the whole armor of God. Put on in duo. Be clothed. Be clothed in power from on high. Have a look at Acts chapter 1. Acts 1 4. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Notice this. The whole triunity of the Godhead is involved in helping the church be what she should be for this hour. You heard of from me, for John baptized with water. John baptized with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now John tells us in his gospel, I baptized you with water. But there is one coming. Who is that one? There's not one baptizer in the New Testament, there's two. There's John the Baptist and there's Jesus the Baptist. Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit and fire. You... Friends, if something is coming from Jesus, you can trust him. There's one coming and you'll be baptised with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the epochs, the seasons, which the Father has fixed by his own will. But you will receive dunamis, dynamite. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Hallelujah. Okay, let's go a little bit further this morning. Have a look at 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1.21. 1 Peter 1.21 Well, 1 Peter 1.20 But know this first of all Know this first of all That no prophecy of scripture Is a matter of one's own interpretation For no prophecy was ever made by the act of human will But men moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. Paul says all scripture is God-breathed. Listen, friends. If we have a problem with the Holy Spirit, we have a problem with the Word. Do you understand? Because the Word came to us through men that were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word of God is fully God and fully man. It's been brought to us by men that were moved by the Holy Spirit to pen what they penned. And what we, where we're at right now is a pick and choose society. Well, I pick the word. Well, I pick the Holy Spirit. Well, I pick the Father. Well, I pick the Son. Well, I pick the Holy Spirit. You can't pick and choose. They come together. Hear, O Israel. The Lord thy God is one. He is one. He can't be separated out. You can't say, well, I want the Father and the Son, but I don't want the Holy Spirit. You can't say, well, I want the Holy Spirit, but I don't want the Father and the Son. 
I know people that have made the Holy Spirit the center of the New Testament. That is wrong. The Holy Spirit is not the center of the New Testament. Jesus is. The Holy Spirit's job is to point people to Jesus. But I know people that have out and out rejected the Holy Spirit and say it's all about the Word. Friends, we wouldn't have the Word without the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Do you see the problem? This is the problem. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. Verse 1. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal. Oh, how beautiful. One day, one day by the grace of God, he showed me the water of life, clear as crystal. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Irrigation canals from the crystal clear river of life, irrigating the channels and the villages and the towns in the millennial reign, going beyond. He showed me a river. But where does the river come from? It comes from the throne of God because the river can't be separated from the one that gives the river. This is what it means. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. The writer isn't saying, Oh, Holy Spirit, I want to drink from you, Holy Spirit. That's not what the writer is saying. The writer is saying, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you, O oh God. Yeah. I, every every uh, Friday, we try to go walking up Castleton. And I try to do a, a valley walk and a mountain walk. And in the valleys, there's these beautiful streams. You can, they're that pure you can drink from them. Yeah. Now, I can, I can... When I look at those streams... It's pointless me saying, I'm not drinking from that stream. I want to drink from the source of that stream. You see, the source of that stream is in the mountain. It's deep within the mountain. What I have to drink from is the stream. And I can benefit from drinking from the stream. But you can't separate the stream from the source. They're inseparable. The Holy Spirit doesn't act on his own accord. When Jesus says, I will give you another one, the word another means I will give you one that is exactly the same as me. They don't act separately. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And it's a compound one. John baptized with water, Jesus says, but I am coming to baptize. Who is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit? It's Jesus. There's nothing to worry about, church. There's nothing to worry about. It is Jesus who baptizes in the Holy Spirit and fire. This is what Jesus said in John 7, 37. If any man thirsts, he doesn't say if any man thirsts, let him come to the Holy Spirit. He says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. For whoever drinks of me out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Then I saw a river, crystal clear, proceeding from the throne of God. You cannot separate the river from the source. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Is this making sense, church? You see, nobody in the right mind would reject air because once upon a time they, they, they breathed in some air that wasn't particularly nice to breathe in. There's always going to be counterfeits and they'll probably get worse if the truth be known. And we'll be looking at that in this session. They will get worse. But to out and out reject the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the move of the Holy Spirit today based on that is silly. It's silly. And as I said last week, I mean it. For me, it's the Holy Spirit or bust. If the Holy Spirit doesn't turn up, I may as well not be here. I can't do it without him. I've heard preachers say it's a piece of cake. I've heard them say those exact words, it's a piece of cake. It's not for me. It's the Holy Spirit or bust. 
So it's so important that we understand, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now let's go back and we'll get on to what we're looking at this morning. Put on. Put on. Jesus says you'll be clothed with power. It's the same word. Put on. It's the same word. Put on what? The whole armour of God. The whole armour of God. So that you may be able to stand. That word stand is such a powerful word. It can mean eyeball to eyeball Amen. with the enemy. Amen. Do you understand? This is not, this stand isn't, Whoa, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. This is a stand. This is a stand. Hold your line, as they say in the army. Hold the line. Hold the line. Hold the line. This is a stand. So be strong in the Lord and the power is might. Put on. Be clothed. Let it be your second skin. Put on the whole armour of God. We'll look at that. The whole armour. So that you may be able to stand. Have a look at Mark. The Gospel of Mark just for a minute. The Gospel of Mark. Sorry, 3.22. Gospel of Mark, 3.22. Uh, when his own people, sorry, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebub. He casts out demons by the rule of demons. So every time Jesus began to Move. This was a messianic claim to be able to, for the mute to speak. It was a messianic claim and they knew it. Yeah. So what did they do? They, they accept him as Messiah or they say, oh, he's casting out demon by the prince of demons. Yeah. Yeah. And that was not the case. He was casting out demons by the finger of God, <coughs> by the Holy Spirit. And so... He, and he called them to himself and began to speak to them in parables. He said, how can Satan cast out Satan? How can Satan cast out Satan? And this is where we're at. We've got so much bickering. And people just, just bickering over sometimes the silliest of things. I don't think we recognize the battle that we're in, church. I don't think we see it. Well, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is one of the wiles of the enemy. There is no doubt in the scripture that we're commanded, come out of her. I have nothing to do with that. There are many things that we have to separate ourselves from. But the church, the bride of Christ, can't, they, the bride has to stand together. A kingdom that stands against its own kingdom will not stand. And right now we're living in a time, I believe, where we're not really standing together. And we have to. I just don't understand why people can't see this hour. You go about 30 years, or 40 years, when people were getting filled with the Holy Spirit and there was a lot of evangelism, church planting and stuff. Why are we in this place 40 years later and there's such lethargy in the church? I don't get it. The church must stand. We're called to stand. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand but a kingdom that's divided against itself cannot stand. And we've seen it happen over the years so many times. So many times. And people give off their subjective reasons and they get offended so easily. And off they go. And all the while, darkness is looming over this land. Yeah. There's indecision everywhere. And we have the Holy Spirit. 
And Jesus says, don't even worry about what to say at that time because the Holy Spirit will give you the words. That's how good God is to us. And God is for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God is for us. I remember when Richard got married to Leanne. And I was thinking, what do I say to her? What do I say? But do you know the thing that really stuck out to me? And Richard will remember this. He knows what I'm going to say already. It was, it was a clip from Gladiators. It was when the, 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 the main guy, Russell Crowe, remember, he, he eventually gets to go into the Colosseum with this little band of brothers. And he goes into the Colosseum first time. And they're there in the middle and there's all these cheers because the, the people are waiting for these gladiators to get massacred. And it's all rigged. The whole thing is rigged. And he turns around to, to this little band of brothers. He says, whatever comes through those doors, we stand a far better chance of surviving if we stick together. If we stand together, we live. And the doors opened and everything cracks off. Yeah. And they survive. You say, well, it's only a film. It's also a Bible principle. We are to stand. And the word stand means face to face, eyeball to eyeball. I've, it's happened to me. It happened to me at Winsford many years ago. I was threatened. This guy came right the way through the crowd. He came onto the pulpit. He was pulling punches all around me. Not one punch hit me. Not one punch. And the Holy Spirit said to me, do not take your eyes off his eyes. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit said. Do not take your eyes off his eyes. And somehow I managed to track to beam him out of the church with my eyes. And I got him out. This guy was a murderer. He'd been done for murder. And I got him out to the church. There was about two meters or so to go. And Alan Rigby, who was built like a rhinoceros back then, still is, grabbed him and says, come on, son. Grabbed him like that, took him outside, got the guy outside. He burst out crying and starts headbutting the wall at full force. One after the other after another, because the man was possessed. But we're called to stand. We are one. In Christ, and the remnant is small. And there's a difference between coming away from people in Roman Catholicism or this crazy thing or these grave sucking lunatics. There's a difference between that and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yeah. But it seems to me that Christians love to find something to divide over. It's fun. It just seems to be fun. Or is it boredom? I don't know. Maybe it's boredom. Probably boredom. Let's go back to the text. We're only looking at one verse this morning. Put on the whole armour of God. So that you may be able to stand. Eyeball to eyeball. Together. You ever seen those Roman armies? They're terrifying. I mean, imagine just getting past the shield for one thing. You get past the shield, then they've got the breastplate. Then they've got a sword. They're well kitted out. Well kitted out. And then when they do the whole tortoise thing and they come together, oh, it's phenomenal to watch. It's like four man, four, formation swimming or something. Incredible. It's like watching the red arrows in the sky. They move together as one, shields locked, ready. Put on the full armour of God, the whole armour of God, so that you may be able to stand firm. And this is it, this is what we're looking at this morning. Against the wiles of the devil. So in the next verse we're introduced to the principalities and powers. But in this verse I want to look at the wiles of of the devil. The Bible tells us that the devil was an extremely intelligent created being. Very, very intelligent. And there are warnings in the Bible about messing with Satan. We'll look at it later in Jude in various places. 
But this isn't about messing with Satan. This is about taking your stand against the wiles, the trickery. And the, the, the wiles, there is a method to them. We get the word method from this. There is a method. There's a lot of planning and preparation that has gone into your possible destruction. Which by the grace of God will not happen because we are more than conquerors. Amen. But there's planning boards and committees. <laughs> All kinds of things going on. There's intelligence. And intelligence reports. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. Because although these things are incredibly sophisticated, they are also quite predictable. This t about, around about this time last year, we went over to South Africa. And we, went, we did like a tour around all these farms. And we got to one of the farms in what you call the Kalahari. Beautiful place. And they'd, they'd done out a room for us to stop in. And it was absolutely marvellous. And Bruce came over, he says, now, um, he says we've, we've actually just got rid of a king cobra from just by where you are. He says, so I just do need to tell you that there are a lot, quite a lot of snakes. Uh, and he went through the thing and he'd, recently he'd been spat at, straight in his eyes by a king cobra, the, one, the, the spitting cobra. But anyway, so he said... He said um, he said, the worst one is the, is the puff adder. Um, it, it, it's what you call cytotoxic. And, and, and if the puff adder sinks its fangs into you, it disintegrates the cells in your blood. That, that basically what happens is you rot on the inside very, very quickly. You, 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 your whole cellular structure disintegrates. Your blood disintegrates. And um, I said, well, how long have you got? He says, well... Um, you know, not long. So you're out there, we're out there in the middle of nowhere. I'm not kidding you, like miles away from anywhere. And, um, you know, if it's left hours, you'll die. But if they manage to get to you within, let's say, two or three hours, you'll just lose a limb. So it just disintegrates your blood. It disintegrates your blood. So they have to amputate, you see. Now, I want you to think about this this morning because these are the wiles of the devil. And what the devil wants to do is chop limbs off the body. Well, what, actually, what he wants to do is destroy the body. He's very predictable, but also very, very intelligent. Now, the serpent was more crafty. The word is, it means wisdom. And it's, you, you will never outsmart the devil, folks. Never outsmart the devil in your own strength. Impossible. Neither will we, some people get into this demon bashing thing. You know, ghostbusters and all that. But it's Jesus that takes out the Antichrist. Yeah. We can't do that. But we can take a stand. We can take a stand. Now his methods, his wiles are, are actually very predictable. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God really said? Has God really said? This is always his first Port of call. Always, church. Listen to me, because this is going to happen. And as we move closer and closer to the climax of the ages, the church has to stand. We have to stand. But we have to stand together. And understand me here. This is a life or death situation. This here. Is life or death? You eat from this tree, God says, not day, you will surely die. This attack is because there is a life or death, something here that's worth attacking for. 
Ultimately, the thing that's going to come under the biggest attack in the future is the gospel and the assurance of salvation. I promise you. That's going to come under the biggest attack of all. The gospel and the assurance of salvation. In many different ways, from many different angles. And so the question always comes, is this really what the word says? Is this really what the gospel says? Is this really? It, does the, ob the obvious meaning of the, of the text, is that what it really means? And Eve begins to think, did God really say that? Is that really what it means? Is it that simple, really? And the fangs go in. And the venom goes in. And the, the, there's a disintegration beginning on the inside. And the more you allow that venom to sink in about the gospel, the more likely you are to end up without a limb. Or worse still, once this venom has gone in, that's when he comes in for the kill. You shall not surely die. This is not what it means. And then he mixes that. He always does this with cults. Yeah. So on the one hand, he'll say, did God really say? Once that's gone round and round and round enough times, then that's not what it means at all. But then there's always a hook. And the hook is always to the ego. And he says to Eve, Eve, you're kind of special. You know? And God is actually withholding from you very, very deep things that I can actually show you. You can actually almost be like God's. And every cult falls for the same thing. Every cult does it. First of all, you create doubt. The venom goes in. It begins to rot. You, at that point, you've got to pull away quick. Because there is an anti-venom. I'll look at that at the end. There is an anti-venom. But you've got to pull away quick. Once that doubt is in, they go in for the kill. And there's always a promise that you're special. There is a deep, hidden truth uh, that God doesn't want you to know. But I can show you. Let me show you the deep things of God. And it says this in Thyatira about Jezebel and the deep things of God. And he, he, listen, you need to understand, he absolutely hates the gospel. The greatest demonstration of the love of God. God demonstrates his love in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the gospel. And this is what's going to come under the attack and the assurance of salvation. Have a look at Matthew chapter 4. Adam and Eve fell. Now the attack is on Jesus. In Matthew chapter 4. At the age of 12, 13, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem for his bar mitzvah. And Mary and Joseph don't even realise on the way back that he's not with them. And after three days, they think, where on earth is he? They backtrack all the way. Mary says, son, didn't you realize you've, you've caused your father and I great concern? And Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. In other words, by the time of his bar mitzvah, he knew he was the son of God and he knew that Joseph was not his real dad. By his bar mitzvah. What happens with the temptation in here is just prior to his baptism. And at his baptism, the word of God goes forth. This is my son. This is the word from God, the Father. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. By his bar mitzvah, he knew that he was the son of God. 17 years later, it's reaffirmed by the word of God from heaven. At that moment, 
The Trinity was together. The Father was there. The Son was there. And the Spirit rested upon Jesus like a dove. You can see the triunity. It was a very special moment. And God the Father said, this is my beloved Son. It's Him. So Jesus had that confirmation. Incredible confirmation at the age of 30. Straight after that comes the word from Satan. If you are the Son of God. There's always this doubt that's thrown into the blatantly obvious. And there are things that we can fall out about, folks, and it doesn't matter. There's things that just don't matter, they're just red herrings. And the devil's there laughing because the church takes up so much time just debating rubbish, stuff, stuff that doesn't matter. But the gospel matters. The fact that Jesus is the Son of God matters. Amen. And when God puts it in black and white and it's simple enough for a child to understand, it matters. And Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Immediately after being confirmed, this is my son, my beloved son. I'm so pleased with him. And after he had fasted, notice, he doesn't go up there as a weak and feeble man. He makes sure he's fasted. Yes. Last week there was a call to fast. I knew nothing about it, to be honest with you, until too late. But I did it. I did three days. I was told by my surgeon that fasting isn't a good thing, really, because of your bowel situation. But I felt last week I wanted to join in. Thousands and thousands of people all over the place fasting for, for what's going on around the world, repenting. And I wanted to join in. And I, I can remember one day on Glebe Farm, I was on the farm and um, Alfie the horse comes towards me. Now, Alf, so I think it was the second day and I was feeling very hungry. And Alfie comes towards me. Now, when you've lived on a farm for a while, you realise that a horse isn't coming towards you because it wants a pat. <laughs> I, I used to think that. No, it's coming towards you because it wants food. Because for, for a horse, for us, food is like, whatever, you know, we've got supermarkets full of this stuff. You can, in, in this day and age that we're in, you can do no work whatsoever. You don't have to do anything. You still, you know, and people take food for granted. And Alfie came towards me and I gave him a pat. I said, Alfie, you're right, food does matter. <laughs> and when you give Alfie a, 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 a you, you're allowed to give Alfie an apple, but not the other one. When you give Alfie an apple, oh my goodness, I think he thinks he's at the jackpot. And he eats this apple, and then as soon as he's finished, he, he comes up to the gate by the van and he kicks it. Keeps kicking the gate until you get, well, we, don't, we can't get him another apple, but he won't stop. <laughs> he keeps on kicking it. Food is important, church. And there is something about fasting. You, you know, there, are, there are things that we preach about and talk about and share about that actually, in the long run, don't make any difference at all. We blab on about them, but really they don't make any difference. But there's other stuff that really does make a difference that really does work, actually works in the real world. And one of them is fasting. Fasting works. Fasting humbles you. And he, Jesus went into the wilderness in the right mindset, exactly the right mindset. Fasting humbles you. But fasting doesn't just humble you. Fasting draws you closer to God. Well, something weird happens when you fast. You don't really care less about things that are just, you just think, that doesn't matter, does it really? It doesn't matter. It's, if you've got the bare necessities and the basics in life, you've got everything. Yeah. And that's the kind of, that's what begins to happen. You just think, well, you know, what, what, what more do you need? And you start to fantasize about some fresh bread with a bit of butter on it. <laughs> but there's something else that fasting does. Fasting clears your mind. Who gets brain fog? Anybody get brain fog? Fasting clears your mind. It's like you've got a supercomputer in your head. You, after fasting, you're like, whoa, 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 where did... God, I didn't realise I could even say that word or pronounce it. There is something about fasting and praying. And we're caught as in fact, Jesus didn't say, 
Um, oh, guys, I, I, I'd, I'd appreciate it if you, if you fasted every now and then. He said, when you fast. He just expected us to fast. And so this is just not a little throwaway thing that Jesus said. I know a lady. I know a lady that fasted 40 days. Well, actually, she drank milk That's other, for 40 days, a 40-day fast. And there are people that are that serious. And there are benefits, friends. There are real benefits to this. There's a lot of stuff that's said from the front and in Christian circles that amount to nothing. It's froth. But this isn't. This isn't. This counts. And so that's one of them. And the tempter came and said to him, if. Now, it's true that that word if could be translated since. And so we are, to some degree, down to the mercy of the translators. And what the translators have to work out is which word or which meaning better suits the context. That's what they do. They're experts. They've done it for years, decades. They're trained in it. And so we end up with the Bible, and sometimes one Greek word could be translated three or four different ways, but the translators have spent their lives studying these things, and so they know, well, actually, that's the better word that fits there. And so the word is if. So this call has gone out, you are my son. You are my son. And the very first thing is to put doubt in his mind as to whether he actually is the son. Is this... Similar to what we see in Genesis 3? Of course it is. Because always, always, he will try to to cast doubt upon the word. Always. And God loves you this morning. God the Father loves you this morning. He loves you so much. There's not a person in here that he doesn't love so much. He wants the very best for every single person. And he wants us to press on to the higher call of the Lord. And the tempter comes and says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, he's gone out there to fast. That's the whole point of this. To go out there to fast. You see, what a train crash this is. He goes out there to fast, and the first thing the devil says is, why don't you have something to eat? I mean, what? That's the opposite of why I'm going there. But you can, can't you? You can take these stones, if you're the son of God, if you are, you can take these stones, you can make them into lovely fresh bread. Nothing better when, after a fact, nothing better than fresh bread. The best. You could probably smell it, Jesus, you know? But that's not the objective. The objective is not to eat. The objective is to fast. He's always coming with a train crash. And Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus says, it is written. We'll be looking at this when we get to the sword of the spirit. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I'm not here for this. I'm here to spend time with my father and prepare for ministry. We see Paul doing something quite similar to this. It tells us in Galatians that he spent time apart and he learned so much in that time. Then the devil took him into the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. Kind of like an an out thing. 400 foot drop. And he said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. Throw yourself down on the floor. And then he says, because it's written. And then he he quotes Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you. And their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Now why did he take him to a temple? Well, some will say because tradition, Jewish tradition. You see in Malachi 3.1 it says the Lord is coming suddenly to his temple. You see, So they, they were expecting the Messiah to come to the temple. So he took him to the top of the temple, 400 foot drop. And the Messiah said, when the King Messiah uh, reveals himself, he will come and stand on the roof of the temple. That was their tradition. That's what he'll do. So we took him to the roof of the temple. He says, look, you can really put on a show here. You can let them know once and for all who you are. Just throw yourself off. Let the angels do their thing. 
and you, you, they'll, they'll all be putty in your hand. Now, never does, is the Holy Spirit used for miracles for no reason. There's never a time when a display of the power of God is there for no reason or to puff somebody up. Never. Never. But watch what Jesus does here. This is really important. Jesus said to him, to the devil, on the other hand it is written. He doesn't deny Psalm 91. What he's saying is, you're quoting it out of all context. That's what he's saying. He doesn't deny that that's what the psalm says, but it's not the right word for the situation. Jesus has come there to fast and to pray and to get ready for his ministry. Satan is saying, shortcut the whole thing. Go to the temple. Throw yourself off. There'll be an awe of you. And Jesus says, now, on the other hand, it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. That must take, imagine that. I mean, can you imagine that? No, probably not. But he's almost looking through history. He's looking at all the kingdoms through history, everything. And he said to them, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Now, who is Jesus? He's fully God and fully man. So you've got Satan here saying to the God man, you worship me. What audacity. The audacity of him. You see, the Antichrist do the same thing. The audacity. You worship me. Unbelievable. I'll give you everything. It's all yours. You don't have to go to the cross and endure the pain and the affliction. Just come and bow down to me and it's all yours. You can be free. The buses will be open for you. The trains will be open for you. Transport will be open for you. You'll still be able to be paid. You'll still have your job. Just take the mark. And it's all yours. All of it. All of it. Bow down to me. And you can have your life back. It's what? All the way throughout church history, it's the same thing. It's what they do. It's what they do. You can have your life back. Just bow down to me. And the devil, and it says, then Jesus said, get away, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Amen. How incredible. What a statement. Yes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. Yes. This is part of the triunity speaking to him. God in flesh is saying, you shall worship the Lord your God. I created you. Unreal. What is going on? Mind-blowing. But that's the audacity. That is the audacity. Now I want you to see. Adam and Eve fell. If it isn't, wasn't for the Lord, you and I would fall just the same. We wouldn't be any different than Adam and Eve. But Jesus didn't fall. Jesus did not fall. Jesus resisted the devil. And we are to put on the whole armour of God. And you know what the armour of God is? Jesus. That is the armour of God. Why is the promise so secure that if we put on the whole armour of God, we will stand? Because in essence, we're putting on the gospel. We're putting on Christ. We're putting on truth. We're putting on righteousness. We're putting on the gospel of peace. We're putting on faith. We're putting on salvation. We're taking hold of the sword of the Spirit. And we are praying in the Spirit. We're putting on Christ, and Christ prevailed against the devil. Amen. Have a look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2, 2 Corinthians 2.11.
halfway through Corinthians 2.11 it says, We are not ignorant of the schemes. We're not ignorant of the schemes of Satan. The wiles, the wiles of the slanderer. The word devil is not his name, it's his job description. He's a slanderer. Yeah. Yeah. It's his job description. And one of the things that he does, and we are not ignorant of his schemes, and the word schemes means thought life. What goes on in your mind? Bob Dylan says he, he ride, you can ride over Niagara Falls in the barrel of your skull. You've got Satan going round in the barrel of your skull down the Niagara Falls. The mind is what he goes for. It's part of his schemes. It's part of his wiles. He wants to get squatters' rights in your mind. And he says, well, you let me in. You entertain this stuff. I've got squatters' rights. You're not going to get me out. Have you ever been there? Have you ever allowed yourself to entertain things and you find that you just can't get them out? You know what happens then? You think it's normal. You normalize it. So you start to think that those thoughts are actually normal thoughts. And then one day... Because God loves us so much, he wakes up and he, and he says, do not entertain this any longer. Yes. Do not put up with this thing. Do not put up with it any longer. You think, but I've put up with it for years. Yeah. It's been riding around in my mind like an empty barrel for years. Yes. He's been squatting in my mind. He's got squatter's rights. I can't get him out. I know. And I'm telling you, don't put up with it any more. Second Corinthians 10.5 For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are powerful, they're mighty, for the pulling down, for the pulling down of a stronghold. I shared this with you a few times. I, I actually know people that are think, thinking similar things right now. I knew there was something wrong with me, physically. I knew there was. For two years, I knew there was. So every day, cancer, 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 cancer. But people would say, go and see the doctor. No, because if I go and see the doctor, they'll tell me I've got cancer. That was it. That was my logic. That was, can you believe that? That was my logic. And people say, well, there's something wrong. You go to the doctor. No, because if I go, they'll tell me I've got cancer. And it got worse and worse and worse and worse until I was in so much pain, I had no choice but to go. And they, they found a bowel that had wrapped around itself, strangulated itself. But while I was in there, they found a tumour. And if I hadn't have gone in, I'd be dead by now. But the, but the devil keeps on telling you things. He, he nests in your head. He gets into your skull. He says, I've got squatters' rights in here. I remember being on a boat coming back from Albania, and it was midday, and it was absolutely horrendous storm. Horrendous storm. And when we got over to Italy, this storm had turned cars over upside down. And it's midday, and we're on this thingy, coming back from a mission. And I'm, I'm sitting in this ship, and it's pitch black outside at midday, pitch black. And the ship's keeling right over like that, these massive waves. And the Lord said to me, do not accept this situation. And I thought, wow. So I went out on the deck, and you could hardly stand up. And there was this architect guy with me. He, 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 and he was different to me. We were different kind of people. But I stood out on this deck singing, I will call upon the Lord who is with me. And all of these people inside thought, he's mental. This guy is nuts. 
Who is worthy to be praised? So shall I be saved from my enemy. The Lord liveth and blessed be the rock. And I'm, I kid you not, folks. I used to do a lot of sailing as a kid. It was crazy weather. And I, I finished and, and, and I rebuked the sea in the name of Jesus. I know you think, God, that's you. There, there, there. God bless him. It's the truth. It's the truth. I said it. And, and this voice in my head said, now don't say another word. Go back in. So I went back in, sat down, and it was absolutely no worse. It was crashing. The waves were crashing. I thought, you idiot. Why do you just go out there and say that? And I kid you not, this is God's honest truth. Within 20 minutes, every cloud had gone. The sea was calm. And I have never experienced anything like it in my life. When we got to Italy, cars had been turned upside down. And that night, because we sailed overnight, I got up on the, I, I camped outside. I just got on these deck chairs on the top and just laid out looking at the stars going across the Adriatic Sea saying, you are awesome, Lord. Amen. You're awesome. Amen. And he gets in your head and he says, it's too late for you. You've gone too far. It's over for you. There's nothing left. He rides in your mind. He rides in the barrels of your skull down the Niagara Falls, as Bob Dylan would say. He gets squatters' rights. He says, you, it's too late. You let me in in the first place. I've got a place in here, but we have the anti-venom. Yes. I'll tell you about it at the end. So we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yes. Let's finish off. Have a look at Revelation 12. Let's finish off this morning. Revelation 12 verse 9. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world, deceives the whole world. That's what's going on in Parliament. That's what's going on in the West. It's deception. Where's it coming from? It's coming from the devil. Yes. It's the wiles of the devil. That's who we stand against. Yes. And he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And we'll look at this next week more. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now, salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come for the accuser of the brethren has been thrown down and he who accuses them before God night and day night and day he's an accuser but listen the Holy Spirit is our defender he's the advocate he's the lawyer He's the one that mediates on our behalf, along with Christ. Amen. So here we see a courtroom picture. We see the devil accusing, but we know in the what Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you another that's just like me. The word another means just like me. Who is he? The paracletos. Who is the paracletos? He's the advocate. Yes. He is the advocate. And it's true. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in Christianity that makes no difference. It's just froth. Froth. Modern day froth. But there are some things that make a big difference. I'll tell you one of them. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and they shall rise on the wings of eagles. That works. <laughs> that works. And when you begin to wait upon the Lord, you say, Lord, I'm dry. I'm dry, I don't know why I'm dry, I'm dry. And I know you, I know you, I know you well enough to know that you can saturate me. You've done it before and you will do it again. I've got things going around in my mind, I can't get them out Lord. I'm coming to wait upon you. And those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and they will rise on the wings of... One day we will, one day we will... I believe we can soar now, but boy, we're going to soar in the rapture. We are going to soar in the rapture. The Holy Spirit is our defense. He's our advocate. He's our lawyer. And he brings scripture to remembrance just at the right time. That's incredible. 
So it doesn't leave you comfortless. He says, at the, just at the right time, I will give you just the right thing to say. And this is the, this is the anti-venom. <coughs> Remember, Adam and he fell. And, and it says later on, the consequences are that he's going he's to bite. He's going to bite your heel. But he is going to crush, Jesus, the Messiah is going to crush his head. But he will, he will sink his fangs into your heel. And they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. That is the anti-venom. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They believed in the gospel. They believed that Christ died personally for them. They overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony that Christ has saved me. And they did not love their life even unto death. But how can they say Christ has saved me? Because it tells you in Romans 8, 16 that the Holy Spirit testifies that we are the sons of God. Amen. Do you understand, friends? Amen. This is the gospel. Amen. The gospel is so safe. It's so secure. Jesus promises, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Not, not even until the end of the age. You would have to do something completely crazy. You would have to turn and reject Christ completely. Reject the cross. Reject everything. I am turn I am reject. I know people that have done that, by the way. That have completely rejected him. Turned around and says, no more. That's it. I'm done. But I'll tell you, it, I believe it is extremely difficult to lose your salvation. It takes an absolute rejection of what Christ has done. But I want to tell you this this morning. The blood of Jesus is the anti-venom. And you've got to get that blood into your bloodstream as quick as possible before you start to lose limbs. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. Verse 7. He who overcomes will inherit these things. All things. Listen. Listen very carefully, church, now. To all seven churches, to all seven churches, Jesus says, the one who overcomes and there's always a reward. All the way through, all seven churches, even the good ones. The one who overcomes and then there is a reward. At the end here we see he who overcomes will inherit all things. We're told how we overcome. We overcome by the anti-venom. By the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. They do not love our lives unto death. But we must overcome because there is nothing in the Bible for the one that doesn't overcome. Nothing. To the church of Ephesus, to the church of Smyrna, to the church of Pergamon, to the church of Thyatira, to the church of Sardis, to the church of Philadelphia, to the church of Laodicea. You must overcome. You must overcome. You must overcome. And this is how you overcome. By the blood of the Lamb. And the word of his testimony. And you do not love your life until death. This is the anti-venom. I didn't know this. I had no clue. No clue. But did you know this, right? Every year, they inject snakes' venom into sheep, particularly lambs. And do you know what happens to the blood when uh, snakes' venom has gone in? You get anti-venom. And the purest anti-venom is found in the blood of the Lamb. They overcame him. 
by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony that you might know. The big attack is coming upon whether you know you're saved or not. That's where the big attack is coming. You know about the wiles of the enemy. Every single person. You've been, we've been given everything to be able to stand, friends. Yes. Now what we've got to do is stand. Yes. 